This is actually, you know, if I were to show someone Haken, this would be the track I would send them. It kind of has a little bit of everything. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Lowen University. Carousel by Haken has been one of the most specifically requested tracks for me to analyze from the band Haken, who have also gotten many requests for. And we're going to be checking out Connor Green's playthrough of this track, which is from their sixth studio album, Virus released in 2020. Now, when I saw this, I thought that has to be intentional. But according to the band, the album title generated surprise that was announced during the pandemic, but vocalist Ross Jennings said it was just coincidental. So I'm not familiar with Haken's later work, so let's jump in. Carousel, Haken, Connor Green, bass playthrough. I've been holding on too tight to let you go. Always loved his voice. Just pure, warm. It's like a blanket. Always liked it. Wish we could go back to B flat. G to D. But we're too close to the B. Ooh. Punchy. Ding wall. Man, that is a filthy tone. That's a trippy time signatures. I I expected this. Okay, so far we're kind of revolving around B flat, G minor, D minor. So essentially, it sounds like it would be in D minor. And I've, I've never really known Connor playing with a pick. I know he didn't play on those first few albums, but I've seen other clips of him. I follow him on Instagram. Him and I have exchanged a few words over the years. Super nice guy. And I've always seen him playing fingerstyle. And one of, the, one of my favorite videos he did was when he was practicing for his tenure with Mike Portnoy playing the Shattered Fortress, the AA Suite. When they did that whole run, I was watching his his kind of vlogs about him practicing that. I, his fingerstyle technique is incredible, especially that one of him playing the Glass Prison. I actually talked about that in the Glass Prison video. But I haven't seen him play with a pick. Um, that tone and sound sort of lends itself to their genre, so I'm not surprised he's using it. Of course, Dingwall, grand piano-like tone, punchy, immediate, cutting. Um, I have one on the way to me. I'm going to make a video about that soon, so I'm excited to kind of wrap my head around the way they sound and stuff. I've not really played one before, but more on that later. Let's keep going. This is a long track. I really like how it started with this. I don't know if that was a verse or if that was just like a standalone phrase. Uh, I know this band have some very interesting musical arrangements, of course, being a, a progressive metal band with a lot of a lot of twists and turns from what I remember. So let's keep it going. He's tuned down. He's fretting a D there. Could be anything. Still in D. And I like these synths and pads back here, sort of building a soundscape. Instrumental break. <laughs> the, the tone is so filthy. That's kind of Maynardy right there. Kind of has a tool vocal vibe. I really like that.
man, those notes are just so clear and crisp. I, I just I love the bass mix on here. I did read here that Adam Nolly Get Good Nolly produced this album and the album prior to it. I'm reading that the albums are actually kind of related. So I've got to kind of sit down and listen to both of these. And they tapped Nolly to also engineer, I don't know if engineer, but mix and produce, whatever this says here. So both albums had the same sonic feel since they were sort of, um, it's kind of a dual album release. Uh, not at the same time, but they they have some overlap, I guess, in the, the song content musically. Uh, I don't have context here, just reading. But I know Nolly has incredible metal bass tones. He also plays Ding Wall, so it's no surprise how this sounds. Maybe the band mixed this. I'm not sure. But he's kind of adding some out-of-key notes. I'm noticing we're hovering around that same D minor thing. But I hear some flat two in there if we're in key of D minor. I hear some E flat, but it was kind of down low. So they might be sort of shifting the tonal center here, which, you know, nothing will surprise me with a band like this, but... So far, there's a lot of slow burn build, a lot of accents, a lot of space, and the vocals are kind of ramping up in intensity. Time signature-wise, I heard a lot of bars of six. I heard a bar of six that was cut short, so I'm not sure. I'm not listening too closely to that. I'm kind of getting the big picture of the composition, but just really beautiful textures, the pads, the scents. I love Ross's vocals, and of course, this bass tone cannot be ignored. And one thing I want to say, too, is that sometimes I avoid doing bass playthroughs on this channel. Because a lot of bands tend to leave the vocals out. I don't really understand that. I mean, if you're really wanting to just see the bass part, sure. But I like hearing the full composition. A lot of times, great bass players will latch on to elements of the vocals or vice versa. The vocals will go higher, you know, like a second chorus. They'll go up in range and the bass player will go up. You know, I want to hear how that stuff kind of coalesces in the composition. I think the big picture is important. So kudos to them for keeping the vocal track in here because it's giving some direction to these kind of broken up parts so far. There's a B there. That's not in the key either. So yeah, that's like kind of, I guess they're borrowing that B minor, if that is. Sounds like there's a sixth in there. It's B, B minor, so they're borrowing that from D major. Kind of a sister modal thing here. Really interesting. There was the B again. Yeah, right here. Pretty cool. They, they land on that B every once in a while. And it kind of gives it like a, did that resolve? Did it not? Kind of like unsettling. That's a, a clever thing. You can pull a chord from outside of the key. So what does that mean? So if we're in D minor. Well, if you were to make a chord off of a note that's not in that scale, there's a lot of different ways you could go about it. But in this case, they're using a B minor, so that would be the relative minor of D major. So they're switching to D major for a second, if you will. It gets, it's a little more complex than that, and there's a, there's a lot of roads that lead to the same place as far as this explanation goes. But it's a good way to add a little bit of color. So your ear gets used to D minor, then they throw in that B minor, and it's like, wait a minute, that's a little, a little different color than I've been hearing. It's a good compositional tool. They're kind of relying on that a lot. Kind of the end of these stanzas, if you will. Ooh, that low B flat. That's cool. So previously, Connor's just very drum oriented, locking with the kick drums. You know, the first few minutes of this song, there was less bass action. Now he's kind of repeating that same feel, the dun, 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 catching those hits. But in between the breaks he did previously, now he's jumping up and following the guitar parts. I heard like some unisons there between the bass and the guitar. Yeah. So this is what I called like a, and I think a lot like this in the songs I've played on, you know, 
the first part of a piece, you want to kind of keep it simplistic and build over time. This applies to really any genre. It's not just prog. This is just great bass playing. Great way to kind of build a song. Keep it simple. The second time something comes around, maybe do what you were doing before, the accents or the hits, but just in between those, latch on to keys, guitar, something else, even a vocal melody, as I said earlier. And it's a great expose in how a bass can be a good hybrid of drums and guitar. You know, you can follow the kick and snare and that's all you can do. It'll be a great bass line. You can follow the guitar riff and kind of ignore the kick and the snare. That's a great bass line. Or you can do what he's doing here and kind of mixing them together and giving the piece a lot of linear direction, which is so far so good. I really like it. <laughs> little pick holder. I've never had one of those on my bass. It's like a fun little gadget. I didn't expect this. This is awesome. <laughs> okay. I want to see more finger style. Now that I know he might do it. That's a cool little passage, kind of. Thought I heard that kind of F6 there, if that's what that is. Yeah, that was kind of little... Really like that nice color, nice little bass melody there. Tone's a lot softer here. Did he pick up the pick? I thought he did. Maybe he's just palm muting. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, the last time I thought of this switching pick finger style in the same phrase, bandmade. I don't see that technique used a lot where, you know, a bass player will grab a pick and they'll put it in their fingers and go to finger style. I'm sure it's done all the time, but a really great example was when you guys recommended Bandmade to me. It was really cool. That, those, that, that group had a really great sound. Bass player was really good, but she would switch between slap and pick just seamlessly. So when I heard the tonal shift here, I was like, wait, I swore I saw him pull the pick out of that little thing. Now he's just holding it there. So cool. I like that he's using both. That's a great self-awareness to what the song calls for in that moment. Is it crunchy pick? Is it soft, mellow finger style? Is it soft, mellow finger style way up high on a little melody solo? A lot of dimension here. Really, really good. Perfect. It's great. That was a great way, uh, a great usage of just good palm muting. Look at that. He'll play. He goes down to that low string, and he kind of rests his palm there on the low string when he's not using it. Going back and forth like that's really crucial. You know, you're picking, go way up here. You know, on guitar, you kind of palm mute more on the bridge. But sometimes with bass, it just I, it chokes it out a little too much when you want some fullness and sustain. So he's kind of doing it over, kind of more away from the bridge, kind of as he goes down. Think of it like floating thumb technique I talk about where your thumb is kind of bunny hopping the strings and touching the strings you're not using. You can kind of do that with your palm, not this part of your palm that you would use with guitar playing, you know, more like this, but you can also kind of use this part if you're just going between two adjacent strings. You can kind of watch him do that here. Really well done, keeps the lines clean. <laughs> Right there. Wait, was that a was that a little hybrid pluck thing there? Did he grab a string with his fingers? Looked like it.
time signature is kind of everywhere. F sharp minor now. So now we're out of key again. So we were in D minor before, now we're up to the F sharp. So could just again be switching to D major, which the the three chord in D major would be a minor, F sharp minor. Just kind of planing from just like real obvious major to real obvious minor, <clears throat> even a major third or a minor third apart. Hearing little bits of that as it goes by. G minor, see? Back to that B. Cool. Woo. That's a cool angle, camera angle there. Smooth fretting hand technique. I haven't really mentioned that yet, but this is a just a dedicated angle. He's doing a lot of little micro fretting hand muting things here, I think, based on the way he's kind of laying his finger down, fingers down on those unused strings. Kind of watch this angle here. Let me see where it starts. It's a great way to kind of aid in the plucking hand picking just to make sure all bases are covered so your lines are really clean with these sudden stops and chokes. Really important is the ringing out, especially when you have some drive and effects on it. Sometimes just laying, you know, your palm or your finger over a string down here doesn't cut it off quick enough. You kind of need both hands just really keeping close by and close proximity to make sure no, whoop, whoop, uh, uh, you know, just those extraneous noises that can make it into your recording. Watch the fretting hand here. See how those last three fingers kind of holds them there. He's placing those last three fingers kind of like on the same string, but but he's playing that bottom string, so it makes me think he's doing some sort of muting there. I'm not sure, but it could very well be anything related to that. Right there. Especially with those big jumps. Big just skipping a string jumps with the picks really fast, really easy to have a lot of ringing out. That was cool. Is that the intro? Okay, we're back to where we were. B flat. Was that the chorus in the intro? It was. Very cool. Let's jump back where we were. I think that's where we were. really broken down here. Octaver. What a cool texture that adds. Fly without fear of landing. Switch into a shuffle here. Or is it a hemiola? Okay, that's trippy. Felt like it went to a shuffle. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. But he's he's doing a duple there. So that'd be, you know, if you're in saying six eight, that would be four eighth note, four dotted eighth notes to give it a. My right hand's doing the two against the three. The drums are kind of interplaying on a fine line between those feels there. Let's see. That's just really cool. Vibey. See, here he's playing all just drums. Just really... The drum part sounds kind of unsettling. That's like, and if you're not really tuned in to what's going on, it's like, where's the one? It's there, but the bass is kind of helping you feel the time, and the time is really hard to feel. Again, it's a kind of three against two, and they're just they're kind of playing both sides of that, just with some fill in. 
accents. It's it's really kind of losing ground here time-wise in a very, very cool way. Really interesting feel to complement those vocals. Some tapping guitar back there. Spacey. <laughs> that was really neat. Woo! Okay. That went that went ninety to nothing really quick. Okay, we yeah we got to go back and check this part out. Uh, he's on a carousel, a merry-go-round. But spinning it around, I was like, is it going to go any faster? Here we are. Nice spread out, stretching, tapping, even went two-handed for a minute. I know the, the arm burner that that is doing index, ring, pinky in those big stretches here. Watch this. This one right here. Woo! Look at that stretch. You must have long fingers. I mean, that's a one, two, three. F so three frets apart. And then, man, guy must have huge fingers. Maybe that's part of the Dingwald fan fret. I don't know. Getting one soon. I'll check it out. But just holding that position, I feel the burn in my forearm. And I guess he brings in that plucking hand for the two-handed tapping when it just gets too far for one hand. Really great stuff. You can kind of see him making sure those lines are really clean here. Yeah, as I always say, I say this in every video, it's like my duty. Two-handed tapping is made possible by making sure you, you're laying your arm, your forearm, everything you got over the unused strings, just kind of rolling with it. If you're doing that kind of ascending thing there, you want to get to the top string and it not be like this. Have these notes ringing up. So it just stops. That's because I'm just rolling as I go higher. You can kind of watch him do it here too. It's very crucial. You almost have to close your eyes and pick a passage and just do it. And just don't listen to what you're playing, as weird as that sounds. Listen for noises that shouldn't be there. And you just, it's not like roll your arm and touch the A string when you're on the D string. You just kind of have to find your own version of what's clean as you roll it up. I'm just kind of just putting putting my palm over the strings, kind of in an arcing motion as I ascend. And when you descend, you want to use the left hand to lay over the strings. So I have no muting now, but when I come down, I can use the unused part of my finger to get that. They're laying over the strings. So both of those methods together is how you get those clean lines. Cool. those accents Woo. D F F sharp yeah we're going somewhere here let me go back to that little part when it starts <laughs> That be tense. I keep hearing that they come back to that B minor. It, it just adds a really cool like twist. Like you think it's gonna land here, and they stop halfway and hit that B. Like they're going to C or going back to the one, but that B just gives it like a. A weird detour. I, I like the effect it's adding, and they're doing it frequently enough to where it, um, it's familiar sounding, but it still adds a very nice color to it. Ooh. 
Ooh, that riff has some swagger. Let's see if they bring it back. Smooth. Finally had a night alone. That was cool. Kind of back to the intro again with those accents. He's played this before. Really cool. Notice he went back to the very, very beginning there with just those hits. Kind of shortened it. Now he's doing it again, following the guitar unison, playing both sides, drums and guitar. Just great way to glue all this stuff together. God, that low B flat. Go, go. Many years ago, when a friend showed me Haken for the first time and the album The Mountain, he was really stoked about it. And I remember listening to it kind of passively with him. I really liked it. It had all the elements I really liked. And I, I, you know, I've seen this band. I'm two degrees away from them, just playing in the prog metal world, hearing about them. They're on tours with bands we've toured with, you know, just that kind of three degrees of separation thing. But I've just never gone back and really listened. And this was a really cool track, I think, to bring me back in. It wasn't just three, four minutes of some kind of proggy stuff. This really took me on an entire journey. We had a lot of dynamics here. It it didn't get too crazy in terms of where the key or tonal center went. And that's really good restraint to show in a 10-minute piece. You know, they went out on some tangents for a minute, but they brought it back to that kind of D minor, kind of poppier progression, D, B, flat, G. And what was really cool is when I realized that intro was the chorus, just broken down. Really cool compositional tool. It's like they sprinkled the chorus at you, threw it at you right out of the gate just to get you acclimated with it. And you're like, okay, what was that? Then it was instrumental for a while. Then when the chorus came in bigger, it was like, where have I heard that? I kind of had that aha moment. I went back and that was it. Great songwriting. Great way to keep it interesting. Uh, to make a 10-minute song interesting is really hard. I've tried. <laughs> Maybe I've succeeded. I don't know. But between Tetrafusion and Scale of Summit, there's been some long tracks. But I'm impressed. This is absolutely up my alley. And I need to go back and check out some of these more recent four or five albums they've released maybe in the last six to eight years. I've not listened to any of it. So thank you for recommending Carousel. This is actually, you know, if I were to show someone Haken, this would be the track I would send them. It kind of has a little bit of everything. And I think when Dream Theater retire, these guys are going to keep that, that vein of prog going. They're going to carry the torch. Um, and I'm not saying they sound like Dream Theater necessarily. They have a little bit more of a modern edge, but... It's the clean vocals thing. They're really well done. So thank you guys for recommending this. Thanks for your patience. I've seen this one requested a lot. Make sure you subscribe, like the video. I love you all. Cheers, and we will see you next time.